out at the uh, Indianapolis airport one afternoon. A man was boarding a flight to Chicago wearing an Indianapolis Colts t-shirt. He was a big fan. So he was a bit dismayed when he got to his assigned aisle seat and discovered that sitting next to him in the window seat and the uh, middle seat were two men wearing in New England Patriots t-shirts. Okay. Right. Oh. Clearly this was not going to be a pleasant flight, but you know, the trip to Chicago is fairly brief, so he figured, okay, I'll make it through this. Plus, at church, he had been learning the importance of loving our enemies. So it occurred to him this was an opportunity to practice what he had been learning. As the plane reached cruising altitude, he took a deep breath. I can do this. Leaned back his seat, kicked off his shoes, perfectly at peace, until the New England's Patriot fan sitting in the window seat stands up and says, excuse me, I think I'll go back to the galley and get a Coke. Seeing a chance to be Jesus. The Colts fan says, no, no, let me get it for you. I'm going to go back to the, I need to go back there anyway to go to the restroom. On the way back, I'll stop by the galley and I'll bring you your Coke. Well, thank you, the Patriots fan says. As soon as the Colts fan gets up and walks away, the Patriots fan looks at his buddy, winks, and says, watch this. He picks up one of the shoes left behind by the Colts fan and spits in it. The two have a good chuckle. Before long, the Colts fan is back, hands off the Coke. As soon as he settles back into his seat, the, the Patriots fan in the middle seat says, you know, that Coke looks pretty good. I think I'll go get one. No, no, allow me, the Colts fan says. Gets up, goes back to the back. The guy in the middle seat picks up the other shoe, spits at it. The two Patriots fan have a good laugh. So soon the Colts fan is back, hands off the other Coke. Sits in his seat, and about now it's time for the descent into Chicago. So he puts his seat in the full upright position and slips on his shoes only to realize what had happened. He is livid. He turns to the two Patriots fans sitting next to him and says, when is this senselessness going to stop? All of this hatred and anger and fighting, all of this spitting in shoes and peeing in Cokes. So I guess the Colts fan wasn't as saintly as we thought. <laughs> but he does remind us that we human beings are a cantankerous lot. We naturally gravitate toward grievance and bitterness. We're all about paybacks. And then along comes the Bible and tells us again and again and again about the importance of forgiving. Again and again and again, the scriptures emphasize the critical, central importance of forgiving, leaving us wondering, why? What is it about forgiving that is so important? Why is it that forgiving is at the very heart of what it means to live a spiritual life? Let's start with a prayer. God, forgiving is counterintuitive. Sometimes it even feels unjust. People ought to bear the consequences of their actions. Why do we always, always have to be the ones to forgive, especially when the offense runs deep? Help us to better understand so that we can better live our faith we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Today we come to the final installment in our sermon series on the life of Jacob. And by now, you know the plot, the basic plot line, pretty well. As a young adult, Jacob had once taken advantage of his older brother Esau in a moment of weakness to persuade him to sell his birthright as the elder brother to Jacob in exchange for a mere bowl of soup. And then years later, as, as time passed, Jacob was added again, 
this time impersonating his brother in order to trick his blind and dying father to confer upon Jacob the deathbed blessing that was meant for his older brother Esau. In the aftermath of this, Esau was so angry with Jacob that he swore as soon as their father died, he was going to murder his brother. And so Jacob fled and lived 20 years in exile. But now at the end of these 20 years of exile, Jacob finds himself longing for home and hopes that his brother's anger has had time to cool. So he, he loads up his wives, his children, his servants, and, and all of his flocks, and he decides to take the risk of returning home. As he's traveling back, as they get very near their destination of home, as a precaution, Jacob sends messengers ahead of him to tell Esau that his brother Jacob is coming home. These messengers were there to read the reaction of Esau and report back to Jacob. They report back to Jacob that Esau is coming to meet him with 400 men. Naturally, Jacob assumes the worst, that his brother is hell-bent on finally exacting his vengeance, bringing 400 men to wipe out Jacob, his wives, and his children. But now it's too late to run. They're trapped. And so, so Jacob, as we saw last week, spends the entire night wrestling with God in prayer, pleading for mercy. The next morning, as the sun rises, Jacob rises as well and waits for his fate. That's where we picked up the story today. As the sun rises, as Jacob awaits his fate, we're told in Genesis chapter 33, verse 1, Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming and 400 men with him. So Jacob divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two maids. Now, let's pause right there for a moment. Note that phrase, the two maids. I note that phrase because I need to correct the record on something, a mistake I made a couple weeks ago, and I, I know what you're thinking. Jeff, you made a mistake? <laughs> Impossible. How could that be? But after 24 years of preaching, it was bound to happen once. <laughs> or twice, or three times. Okay, so it happens all the time. But the most recent example was a couple weeks ago when I was talking about the 12 sons of Jacob and, and Jacob's two wives, Leah and Rachel, and the 12 sons that were born to them and failed to mention that there were also two so-called maids in the, pictures, in the picture. Leah had a maid and Rachel had a maid. Each of them also were concubines to Jacob, which means that they also bore some of his children, though Leah and Rachel got credit for those children since it was their maids. It's kind of a, it was kind of an ancient forerunner of the modern concept of, of surrogate motherhood, except in a more coercive and unjust form. And so when I was talking about the 12 sons of Jacob being born to Rachel and Leah, I should have also mentioned that there were two, these two concubines in the picture. Leah's concubine Zilpah bore two children, Leah herself six children, Rachel two children, and Rachel's maid Bilhah bared two children. The point I was making a couple weeks ago is that Jacob's marriage to Leah was unwanted from his perspective, but God nevertheless took that unwanted marriage and made something really good out of it. Because without the children born to Leah and her maid Zilpah, there would have only been four sons of Jacob. God needed 12 sons whose offspring would then become the 12 tribes that would lead to the birth of this great nation that God wanted to raise up. So, the 12 sons of Jacob were born of these four mothers, which now brings us back to today's story because as Jacob looks up and he sees his brother Esau and 400 men coming, he divides his children into four groups by, behind each of the four mothers. And then we're told in Genesis chapter 33, verse 3, Jacob himself went ahead of them, bowing himself to the ground seven times, 
until he came near to his brother. So you got the picture, right? He's gradually approaching his brother. He bows down. He goes a little bit further. He bows down again. Seven times he does this until he's right in front of his brother. And that last time he bows down, I'm sure he's thinking, this is it. This is the moment when my brother is going to give the order and those 400 men are going to swarm me, my children, my family, and we're all going to die. But that's when something extraordinary. Verse 4, Esau ran to meet him and embraced him, fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Whoa. Jacob did not see that coming. Nobody saw that coming. Oh, what a sweet reunion. Esau shows his brother Jacob amazing grace after all that his brother had done to him. Esau welcomes him with open arms. Esau goes on to say to Jacob, what's with all these gifts you sent to me by messengers? Jacob says, I was hoping to win your favor. And then Esau says to him, verse 9, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. I like this guy Esau. Talk about a spiritually mature person. His brother Jacob had swindled him big time, twice. He owed his brother. But Esau's attitude is, I've got enough, brother. Keep what you have for yourself. But Jacob insists. I suspect Jacob needed his brother to accept this gift as a part of Jacob's process of healing from the bad things he had done to his brother. So finally, Esau relents and accepts the gifts. And now these two brothers who had spent a lifetime at war with each other have made their peace. All because of Esau's amazing grace. It's an Old Testament story, no less, of amazing grace. One of the most beautiful stories of forgiveness in the Bible. As the New Testament says about the Old Testament, these stories have been written for our instruction. And so what is it we're supposed to learn from this incredible story of forgiveness? The point I think is obvious that we too should be like Esau, that we should be the kind of people who are incredibly gracious with our forgiveness. But let's be honest, that is hard hard. It is difficult. It is counterintuitive. Forgiving somebody who's really done us wrong can be one of the most painful things we are ever asked to do in our life. So why on earth would I endure the pain of forgiving somebody who's really hurt me bad? In the example of Esau in today's story, I think we see at least three powerful reasons why we should be prepared to endure the pain of forgiving others. Let's walk through those three reasons. Reason number one, why I should be willing, ready, able to endure the pain of forgiving someone who's hurt me really bad. Sorry, I'll come back to that. Forgiving frees me to live well. When we think about forgiving, We normally tend to think that it's primarily for the benefit of the person that we are forgiving. But I disagree with that. Yes, it it benefits the person we forgive. But the primary benefit of forgiving somebody is what it does for us. Esau could have spent the 20 years his brother was in exile stewing, obsessing, and being bitter over all that Jacob had taken from him and all that he would have had. But for what his brother did to him, instead, Esau's attitude is, I have enough. Instead of being obsessed about what somebody had taken from him, Esau made a choice to focus on all that he had left because he seemed to intuitively understand that he understood in the depths of his soul that nobody can take the sweetness of life away from you except you. 
Nobody has the power to take the sweetness of life from you except you. If you read our uh, daily uh, meditations uh, on our church's uh, Be Still and Know uh, daily meditation page, and by the way, if if you don't and you'd like to uh, go to Facebook and and search under Life Journey, Be Still Meditations, and you'll find that page. But if you read it uh, a couple months ago, you know I I did a a meditation about a a research uh, project, a study done at Erasmus University that documented that People who forgive can actually jump higher on statistical average than people who don't. Isn't that funny? We, we are accustomed to thinking of bitterness as weighing on our psyche, weighing on our soul, and it does. Apparently, it weighs so heavy on our psyche, on our soul, that it also affects our body and takes some of the spring out of our step. Think about that. Another study that was uh, reported in the Journal of uh, Psychology and Health documented that people who forgive sleep better than those who don't by statistical average. Yet another series of studies done by Dr. Uh, Kathleen Lawler Rowe documented that people who forgive have lower blood pressure by statistical average over a large group of people, lower blood pressure, and, and report less bodily symptoms of stress. Think about it. Esau could have spent 20 years churning, angry, what that brother of mine did to me, with incredible weight on his soul, on his psyche, that in turn would be doing terrible things to his body. But he didn't do that. He let it go. And because of that, his life was so much better. We forgive not because the other person deserves or needs it, but because we do. Did you get that? We forgive not because the other person deserves it or needs it, but because we do. No matter what you do to me, my life will always be better if I forgive you and let it go. I do not mean to minimize the excruciating pain that somebody can inflict on another person's life. I don't mean to minimize that at all, but no matter what I do with you, no matter how dastardly something is that I do to you, your life will always be better if you forgive me and let it go. Because your forgiveness is not about that other person. It's about your quality of life. It's about the state of your soul, the state of your body. I learned that lesson years ago as a kid watching my father. When I was growing up, my family lived out in the open countryside near Acton, Indiana. We loved living out in the wide open spaces. We lived on a a, a large acreage lot, and then uh, our closest neighbor lived on a large acreage lot. And in between us and our closest neighbor, there was a large vacant lot that eventually the owner of that lot sold it to some folks in the city who wanted to move out to the country. But these city slickers wanted to build a house that was way too wide for the lot they were buying so that to build this house they wanted, the one side of their house would have to come within five feet of the property line of our neighbors, and the other side of the house where they had a side entry garage, the blacktop driveway they wanted to put in in order to get them out of the garage and out to the road would have come smack dab to our property line. So we're way out in the country enjoying the wide open spaces and these city slickers come out and they want to put jam this house in between our house and our neighbor's house. And to do that, they would need a zoning variant. So they went to the zoning board. We and our neighbors went and opposed it, but the zoning board approved it. Dad was convinced that the Nelsons had bribed the zoning board and we were hot, we were mad. We were not happy about this. And then to make matters worse, Ed Nelson decided that though he had never cut down a tree in his life, he was going to cut down the old growth trees that needed to be removed to build his house. So one Saturday morning, we're looking out one of the bedroom windows, watching him cut down this 70-foot tree with his buddy. And it fell smack dab on our neighbor's house. When it hit the roof, it's like a bomb 
exploded, leaving a gaping hole in their roof. Let's just say when the Nelsons moved into their new house, they were persona non grata in our neighborhood. It was like we were now living in a war zone because we'd go out in our backyard and there they would be, right <laughs> over there. And you know, you can picture the awkwardness, right? They're awkward, we're awkward. It's like, I don't even want to be out in the backyard if they're in the backyard, look at it. It was awful. One night we were having a weenie roast out in the, our backyard as we often, why do you laugh? The, <laughs> I come from the country, all right? We, we were having a cookout for you city folks. Over an open fire out in our backyard, as country folk do, having a good time. But then Ed came out in his backyard, and he was working around doing some things, and we we're trying to have a good time. And he's, of course, he's ill at ease as well. As we're sitting there around the fire, there comes a point in time when my dad calls out to Ed, and I'm thinking, oh no, what's going to happen? My dad called out to Ed and said, hey, neighbor, if you've got the time, why don't you get your wife, come over, and we'll have a beer? What? Ed stopped his <laughs> tracks like, what do you say to me? Paused for a second, went into the house, brought his wife Pam, his two girls, Lana and Sherry, out, and we all had a beer. Well, we didn't all have a beer. <laughs> we weren't quite that hillbilly. <laughs> the adults all had a beer. The kids just had marshmallows and weenies. But it was a great time. By the end of the evening, we were friends. Before long, the Nelsons were dear friends to us. Mom provided child care for Lana and Sherry for years. And we had many wonderful years with them. It's like Abraham Lincoln once said, do I not destroy my enemy when I make him my friend? Our life was so much better because we let go and forgave the Nelsons. Forgiving is not about the other person. It's about the quality of your life. We forgive, not because the other person deserves it or needs it, but because we do. Reason number one why we should go through the pain of forgiving. It frees me to live well. Reason number two, you'll be glad that I'm skipping some of this in the interest of time. Reason number two, forgiving is an incredibly generative act. The word generative means the power to make good things happen, to create new life or progress. What Esau did in forgiving his brother Jacob was incredibly generative. Suppose Esau had ordered his 400 men to wipe out Jacob and Jacob's children. If he had done that, there would have been no 12 sons of Jacob. That means there would have been no 12 tribes from which the nation of Israel, God's nation, was formed. If there was no Israel, that means there would be no Hebrew Bible. There'd be no prophets. There would be no Messiah. No Jesus. In one fell swoop, in one act of vengeance, Esau could have wiped all of that out. But by forgiving... He gave the gift of all of that to the world. Think of it. As the eldest son of Isaac, it was Esau's right to be the one who would give birth to this great nation that God was going to create. But Jacob stole that from his brother Esau. But now, in this great act of forgiveness, it's as if Esau himself now becomes the spiritual father of Israel. Because without his forgiveness, there would be no, Israel. Yes, Jacob gets the credit, but in God's eyes, it was Esau's act of forgiveness that gave birth to this nation of Israel. Talk about an incredibly generative act 
one of the most generative things we will ever do in our life is to forgive the people around us. It's not just about the blessings that occur to us, but the blessings that ripple out into the world because of our acts of forgiveness. I read an interesting story the other day on um, ChristianPost.com uh, about a 16-year-old girl named Shannon Etheridge who just gotten her driver's license. And you know how you are when you get your driver's license, right? You, you're an expert driver, you know everything, and you're a little bit too reckless. I remember uh, when my sister's good friend first got her driver's license, she would drive us to high school, to Franklin Central High School uh, every day. And, and her friend would stick her arms through the steering wheel like this. You know, instead of grabbing it like this, she'd put her arms through and, and guide it with her forearms while she was breezily chatting with my sister going way too fast on these country roads. Somehow we survived. I, I don't, I'd be in the backseat white knuckled. I don't know why I didn't just ride the bus instead, but we got lucky, we survived. But Shannon Etheridge wasn't so fortunate. When she was driving over country roads to school one day, going too fast, not paying close enough attention, she hit a woman riding her bike, Marjorie Jarsfor, and Marjorie died. Can you imagine being 16 years old and you are responsible for somebody's death? The guilt was overwhelming. In fact, Shannon became suicidal until Gary Jarsfar, the husband of the woman that was killed, thinking about his wife, knowing her depth of spirit, he knew what Marjorie would want him to do. And so he told Shannon that she was forgiven. And he asked the attorney to drop the charges. The authorities investigating the crime or the, the, the accident had concluded that Shannon was completely guilty. But he asked the attorney to drop the charges. He told Shannon about his wife and what a deep spiritual journey she had been on and that this is what she had wanted. And he encouraged Shannon to pick up the mantle of his wife and, and follow in her footsteps. He said to Shannon, you can't let this ruin you. God wants to strengthen you through this. I'm passing on Marjorie's legacy to you. That was years ago. But it was a pivotal turning point in the life of Shannon Etheridge. In fact, Shannon has gone on to become a well-known Christian author who's written best-selling books about spiritual living that have blessed the lives of multitudes of people. Now think about that. But for Gary Jarsfar's forgiveness and vicariously his wife's forgiveness of Shannon, Shannon wouldn't have gone on to be a deeply spiritual person and to write these books that would bless multitudes. I tell you, our acts of forgiveness are apt to be some of the most generative things we ever do in our life with the ripple effects spreading out and blessing the world. You may remember in worship last Sunday, uh, Robert Hicks Ferguson was talking about in relationships with other people, how how difficult it can be. He, he noted that spousal relationships can be especially difficult because when you, when you live, when you share intimate relationship with somebody over 20, 10, 30, 40, 50 plus years, there are bound to be all kinds of offenses. Lots of occasions that require forgiveness. A case in point, uh, an elderly couple who'd been together forever, uh, Dalton and, and, uh, and his wife Martha, they, they lived way out in the country, and every year they really enjoyed going to their local county fair. And at this county fair, every year there was a, a guy who owned one of these old-fashioned biplanes, you know, the kind of old-fashioned planes that didn't have a roof but were sort of open seating, open cockpit. So there was a guy there that had an old-fashioned biplane, and for 10 bucks you could take a ride on his biplane. Dalton was endlessly fascinated with his plane. Every year when they were there, he would say, Martha, I'm going to ride that plane. And Every year, Martha would say the same thing. She was against it. She was absolutely against it. She would say, Dalton, it's a waste of money. Ten bucks is ten bucks. Every year, Dalton would go home disappointed. One year, they're out at the county fair, 
And Dalton summons his courage and says, Martha, I'm 81 years old. I don't have many more chances to ride that plane. I'm going <clears> to <throat> pay the 10 bucks and get on that plane <clears throat> before it's too late. She was having none of it. Dalton, she says, 10 bucks is 10 bucks. The owner of the plane, having heard this same argument again and again and again every year, he's over it. So finally he says, stop it. Will you just stop it? He says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to give you both a free ride on my plane. On one condition, you don't say a single word for the entire ride. Now, to Martha, this is a bargain, and she likes nothing better than a bargain, so she's all in now. So they get in the biplane, and off they go, and man, this pilot puts it through its paces. He's banking the plane. He's spinning it. He's doing loop-de-loops, not a peep from them. So he puts it through the loop-de-loops, and this spins again, not a single word. As they're coming in to make a landing on the runway, while keeping his eye on the runway, the pilot calls back to Dalton and says, I have to tell you, I'm impressed. You didn't say a single word. Well, Dalton says, I almost said something when Martha fell out. <laughs> but 10 bucks is 10 bucks. <laughs> The moral of the story being vengeance is sweet, right? <laughs> Forgiving is so counterintuitive. But whatever relationship you're talking about, whether it's with a spouse, a child, a parent, a sibling, a friend, a coworker, for any relationship to thrive over time, you have to be prepared to do a lot of forgiving. Forgiving is the single most generative thing you can do in any relationship. Because when you forgive, that releases so much grace into that relationship. So, why should we endure the pain of forgiving? One, forgiving frees me to live well. Two, forgiving is an incredibly generative act. And finally, number three, forgiving brings me closer to the heart of God than anything else. If we truly want to understand somebody else deeply, you have to experience what they experience, right? You, you will feel a close bond with anybody who's experienced the kinds of things you've experienced. For example, if you've had cancer when somebody else has cancer, you are empathetically there with them. You feel the closeness of the bond of that shared experience. To understand somebody deeply, you have to experience what they experience. The central act in Jesus' life was his work on the cross of Calvary. It was hard. It was harrowing. It was brutal and painful, and it was all about forgiving. It was about forgiving us. It was even about forgiving Jesus' executioners. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And Jesus' work on the cross made salvation and forgiveness available to the whole world. Talk about an incredibly generative act. And now we who follow Jesus are called to follow in his footsteps so that when I endure the pain of forgiving someone who has hurt me deeply, I am in my own small way reenacting what Jesus did on the cross and coming closer than I ever will to understanding what Jesus went through. Nothing brings us closer to the heart of God than enduring the pain of forgiveness because that was the central experience of Jesus Christ in this world. That's 
the biggest payoff of our forgiveness of the people around us, how close it draws us to God. Let me close with this. Uh, Beth Moore is a well-known uh, Christian teacher and author. She made national news not long ago when she uh, 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 departed the Southern Baptist Convention in protest of their stance on uh, women, LGBTQ people, and uh, other social justice issues. In one of her books, Beth Moore tells about an evening she was sitting on her couch at home watching a TV talk show that, uh, that featured a uh, conversation uh, with parents who had, whose son, college-age son, had been killed. And what made this interview so unique is that it wasn't just the parents who were there talking, but also their son's killer. Their son's killer was their son's former best friend. And the, the weapon that killed their son was a high drug alcohol level in the bloodstream of his son's best friend while driving a vehicle. There was a terrible accident while he was driving under the influence, and that accident killed their son. Now, here were these parents and their son's killer telling this story. The killer telling stories about his deceased friend like only a best friend could. And the really odd thing was, these parents had taken their son's killer into their home, given him a home. Now he sat at the dinner table in the same chair their son had once sat. He now slept in the same room that their son had once called his room. He would go to work each day with the father because together they were doing safe driving seminars. And Beth Moore says that as I watched this, she writes, I kept trying to put myself in the parents' position to imagine how they did it. But I couldn't. I could not imagine myself in that situation doing that. But then she says, it hit me. Tears started streaming down my cheeks as I heard the Holy Spirit whisper and say to me, no wonder you can't relate. You've put yourself in the wrong position in the story. Beth, you're not the parent in this story. You're the driver. Beth adds, God was the parent who not only forgave me, but also invited me to sit at his table in the place my Savior left for me. In other words, if we are struggling to be able to forgive somebody who's really done us wrong, the most helpful thing we can do is to really get in touch with how much God has forgiven us. All of my greed, all of my selfish acts, all of my anger, all of my bit when we start to get in touch with how much we've been forgiven, when you receive that kind of grace, you just want to share it. You want to turn around and do for others what has been. Just like that boy who was forgiven by his friend's parents. What's he want to do with this? He's received so much grace, he wants to now share grace. When we get in touch with what it means that we have been forgiven, it then fuels our ability to show grace. And when we show grace to others, we're reenacting in our own small way. We're reenacting the central act of the life of Jesus and nothing, nothing draws us closer to the heart of God. It was um, William Stoddard who said, forgiving the unforgivable is hard. So was the cross, hard words, hard wood, hard nails. Ephesians 4.32, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander along with every form of malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, key phrase, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Be imitators of God as dear children. This is the very heart of what it means to be a follower 
of Jesus. May it be so. May we live our faith like Esau did.